Lifers, thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the 1010 podcast. We're talking about life and all things pertaining to the abundant life that we can have through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I have given my life to Jesus. I've been serving him for a long time, and it's honestly the best decision of my life. It's what I was created for, and it's what you were created for too, relationship with Jesus. So I hope that you investigate what that looks like for you if you don't have a relationship with Jesus yet. But I'm super excited for today's episode. I have a special guest with me, Adriana Chavez. I know you're going to enjoy hearing her story. So let's get started. I'm super excited. Can you tell? Yeah, I have actually been really excited this whole time. I feel like um, I just... I'm excited to sit here and talk with you. I know. And this is my first time being on a podcast. For reals? <laughs> well, yeah. in like a one-on-one. Because I was going to say oh, yeah. that um, you and I, like, let's see, we met probably, I mean, it was when Wonder Church came, mm-hmm. a part of Cedar Park and planted yeah. Wonder Church with uh, I think like three Pastor years ago. CJ and Nicole. Yeah. yeah. So like three years ago-ish. And um I remember as our church was starting to create Life PNW and do our life chains that Pastor CJ was like, Adriana is our life advocate girl, you know, for our church. And so that's kind of how I got connected with you. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, we did our first life chain at Cedar Park in 22. So powerful. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. And what we did before that, though, was really cool. Um we put together a panel of different people for our school, for one of our school chapels. And it was a panel of people who each had a story to share about life. Mm -hmm. And you were one of the people on that panel. And so you shared to our student body. And I just remember, um, I mean, I think you're anointed and awesome, but I just remember there was something really special anointing that the Lord had upon you with our student body. Um, They really connected with you. I mean, partly because you're young Mm -hmm. and they're like, Oh, you know, it's not just, you know, some old person up there telling us, you know, that life is precious, but somebody who can really connect with the pressures that kids and young people today face. Um, And so that was kind of when we first got connected. And so around that same time we did, um, I took that panel of people and we filmed their, those testimonies. Yeah. And so that podcast is still on, um, YouTube. I've shared it a couple different times through my podcast on the 10, 10 podcast. So you could look it up, but it's, um, I think it's called like a, a discussion, a Christian conversation on abortion. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it was just perfect timing when it was released because there were other voices. I mean, there's always other voices speaking about abortion, but particularly other Christian church voices Mm -hmm. (laughs) talking about abortion. And so it felt really good as Christ followers to, um, not just speak about our opinions or what's easy, but what the Bible says about life. Um, and that's really, that's really what this podcast is about. It's not about people talking about their opinions, although, you know, we do share opinions, but that our opinions are based and formed around the truths that we, you know, know and find in the Bible. Yeah. That's where we, you know, that's where we get it all from. So, um, that's kind of a little bit of our history. There's so many things about you that are amazing. You are going (laughs) through the school of ministry at Cedar Park church. I graduate next Monday. Yay! It's crazy. I know that's so two crazy. Two years later. I feel like the two years just flew by. Good. Seriously. Good. I was like, it's already been two years, but I'm glad. <laughs> it's that's, almost done. That's amazing. So you yeah. did that and you are a hairstylist. What's yes. the official word for that? I'm a cosmetologist, like professionally on license, but um, yeah, I've just been doing hair for like almost eight years and I love it. It's where God's called me to. And I started my business like three years ago. What's your business called? Image of Blonde. I was actually going to name it Imago Day, yeah. which means um, 
image of God in Latin, or maybe it's Hebrew. Yeah. And then I was like, Imago de Salon. Like, not everyone's going to know what that is. But a lot of people have found me just from the name Blonde in my hmm. salon name. So that was cool. Image of Blonde, even though you are not blonde. Yes, which <laughs> I get that a lot. People are always like... You do blonde hair, but you're not blonde. I'm like, why do I have to have blonde hair? <laughs> you don't. It's just, yeah. that's what people expect, I think. <laughs> yeah. You funny. are not the image of blonde. I'm not. You are the image of raven dark hair. And people think that I don't do brunettes because mm. my business name is image of, image of, blonde. of blonde. And I'm like, guys. Maybe you need a new name. <laughs> I was going to go back to like Imago Day one day or something and just like, okay, it's neither. I think the Lord might be speaking yeah. here. <laughs> It's like neither blonde or brunette <laughs> because you guys are a little ridiculous. <laughs> Just kidding. But seriously, people give me trouble for my name all the time. And That's I'm like, so whatever. Funny. I feel like Holy Spirit gave it to me. So there you go. You know, uh, so you, yep. So you are an amazing hairstylist. And so if you're looking for somebody to do your hair, yeah. check out Image of Blonde. It's a yeah. beautiful little studio. In Sammamish. Uh-huh. A little bit of a drive, but worth it. Yeah. I do your hair. Yes, you do. Do you like what we did last time? Because I really like it. I love it. And I want it. I've decided I'm going to grow it out. Okay. A bit. I'm ready. At least for the summer. I'm down. Let's do it. (laughs) Usually people go short for the summer and you're like, let's grow it. I know. But I think like also you want to put it up more in the summer. That's true. And so if it gets too short, it's just like you just Mm -hmm. have flyaways everywhere it's a little harder to manage yeah. yeah yeah i know plus i just want long beautiful hair like you oh these are extensions <laughs> are they yeah shut your face thank you for telling me that because i was like how does she get hair so perfect? well okay my hair technically is this long but the extensions add fullness, fullness and thickness so then it looks longer because when it's thin yeah. but long it just doesn't seem long yeah you know yeah so here we are well, maybe next episode I'll have extensions. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely more high maintenance. I kind of did it to promote myself as well. I like so, always wanted them to. Yeah, because that you just learned how to do extensions. Because mm-hmm. um, yeah. you you learned how to do the ones that are like permanent. Yeah, like you have to get them moved up every six to eight. Right. Weeks. Not they're not like the like clip in ones. Yeah, like, you can't just take my them girls out. have those, yeah. which is kind of fun too because one day you can have. Well, like they both wore them for their weddings, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And then, so for a special day you can, but then the next day you're like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back. Anyway, so let's go ahead and just dive into, I know I've said a lot of things about you, but maybe start with your upbringing, like how you grew up and, and a little bit about you Yeah. and your story of life, particularly. Oh man, where do I start? <laughs> um, I would say I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I always start with that um, because a lot of people, when I tell them I'm a Christian, they immediately are like, oh, you were raised Mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. And um, I grew up in a very dysfunctional home that my family didn't know the Lord. And um, I just want to start off by saying I totally love my family. Mm -hmm. I don't have any bitterness, unforgiveness, or resentment towards them. So everything that I do say is not, like, to harm them at all. Um, I just want to also speak, like, my story as well and, like, show how God has really moved in my life. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so I grew up in in a pretty dysfunctional, chaotic home. My mom and my dad had me when she was 19 and... He was in prison, my dad was, when I was born. And so he didn't get out of prison until I was like two and a half, almost three, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, so we moved from Seattle to California when he got out of prison. My dad wanted to start a family there. And so me and my sister, my mom and my dad, we lived in California uh, from like three to five years old. And then... um, when my dad uh, got addicted to drugs, he was already addicted to alcohol. When he got addicted to drugs, mm-hmm. he became a lot more violent. Mm-hmm. And so that landed me and my sister to be in 
foster care for a little bit mm. with a family from my from uh, my grandma's church, and then and then eventually I moved with my grandma. And uh, during that time, in order for my mom to get us back from foster care, she had to abide by the government's like the court's ruling mm-hmm. like she had to take certain parenting classes and do all these things my dad also had to do the same thing and but because he did not mm. they would not give me my sister back to my mom unless she separated from him mm. um, and so by the time I was like five my mom and dad had separated she divorced him I mean they had a really like crazy marriage anyways, Mm -hmm. because of his addiction. Yeah. Um, the cops were always being called, you know, my mom was physically abused. Um, and it was just not very safe. Yeah. And so, um, when they separated, you know, it kind of just continued a life of like, there's no, um, what's the word? Yeah. There's no stability. There's, there's not a lot of safe adults, I guess you could say, because mm-hmm. it seemed like as a child, we were just not loved and like nurtured and cared yeah. for in the way that like a child should just because, um, and I don't blame my mom because I think she did the best that she knew how, sure. yeah. but I think that she was so focused as well on like just at least providing a yeah. roof and like food on the it's table a big job. and then like whatever else she was dealing with. Mm-hmm. And because she got sick when I was uh, also like five or six years old with Crohn's disease, mm-hmm. she had to stop working. Um, and the doctors put her on so many medications that she was just like out of it all the time. Mm-hmm. So I feel like when I look back, I see where she tried And she didn't, like, know how Mm -hmm. to raise, I think, two children and then eventually three my brother as a single mom because um, all the guys that she was, you know, with, they could not take care of her. So she was taking care of them. And so to take care of them and three children alone, I think, caused, like, a lot of (laughs) instability. Yeah. And, you know, we... We did not grow up rich whatsoever. Um, it, it, you know, my mom was on food stamps. We um, would always get like hand me downs, and which is like fine. I mean, yeah. I love thrifting. Same, <laughs> like it was fine. But yeah, we just we didn't grow up with all all the things, and so um, that left me super broken. And by the time I was like 13, almost 14, I actually moved back up here to Seattle from California Mm. to be with my dad. Me and my sister did because he was finally sober. Okay. And so we're like, okay, it's a good time. Mm -hmm. Like we were just supposed to visit for the summer, but then we're like, let's stay. Let's just live up here with dad. Like start a new life. Cause we, me and my sister, we just hate it. (laughs) living in California really in my hometown. I mean, (laughs) you just got to visit and then you're like, okay, yeah. Whereabouts in California were you? Orville. Orville. Yeah. No one ever knows where it's at. I don't know. It's in the middle of nowhere. Okay. It's like right next to Chico and like all these hills okay. that are yellow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so mm. anyways, um, by the time I was almost 14, um, we moved back up here and my dad was sober. So it was great. I started high school up here. I mm. went to Riverside High School and... About nine months in, I think, of living here, um, he relapsed and, like, left. And so um, his girlfriend at the time was just like, you guys need to move back in with your mom. Oh, no. And so my mom had just moved up here. Okay. Too, as well. And so we moved back in with her um, because my dad, he, with his addiction, like, he would just disappear. Mm. And so that was very hard and it left me very broken Mm -hmm. from at the age of 14. Like I just moved up my life, Mm -hmm. you know, here as a teenager, it's like you feel abandoned, rejected. And like, um, were you able to keep going to the same high school? Like, did your mom live close to Riverside? Yeah. 
I was still able to go. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I was super depressed. Mm. I, as a teenager, like you just don't know how to live mm-hmm. when it feels like everything else around you is just falling apart. Yeah. And so I, I wouldn't say I was suicidal, but I just didn't want to live anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and also I like, <laughs> I feel bad saying this, but I did not like my family. Like I lived with my mom, my sister, my grandma, my brother, and we would all just like fight, mm-hmm. you know, we would not talk. We would yell. Well, nobody we scream. Jesus, right? <laughs> no one. Yeah. Again, I didn't it's come just... from a Christian family, so no one knew how to be loving, patient, kind, have self-control, like none, none of that, yeah, not yeah. even me. I was like, yeah. and so I remember, um, this girl invited me to youth group one day and from I had school? no idea from school. Yeah. I didn't know her at all. Oh, I walked up to her cause it was the voice of God. He's yeah. like, go talk to her. Okay. And so I did. And that was very abnormal for me because I normally don't do that. I would never put myself out there and just go up to a stranger. But I literally was drawn to her mm. and I, she was walking in front of me and she was like glowing. Wow. And so, and I could only see the back of her, you know? And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go talk to her. And, um, she mm. invited me to youth group. I'd never been, I didn't know what that was. I was like, sure. I don't know what that is. <laughs> and she's like, okay, I'll pick you up. She comes to my apartment and we drive right across the street. <gasps> her mom like picks us up, you know? Okay. And I'm like, when did this church get here? And what? it's like, so it was literally like right next right to right there. Oh. And I'm like, I never thought about walking into a church you wow. know? Um, right across the street from me. That's amazing. And I had been exposed to church a few times. Okay. Like people have taken me before and I would go and like, sometimes I would cry and I didn't know why I was mm. like, why am I crying? Like, I don't know. Um, mm. But it wasn't until like that night, CJ, my mm. pastor now was the youth pastor <laughs> and I walk in and all these like young kids, you know, teenagers are like raising their hands, worshiping the Lord and they're just singing. And I was like bawling and I'm like, what is happening? Like, Mm. I don't know what's going on at the end of the night. Like, I mean, it was like CJ was preaching directly to me. (laughs) (laughs) And so I, I raised my hand, gave my life to Jesus. And I remember, I always tell people this, I walked in feeling like the weight of the world was literally on my shoulders. And I just was felt, I just felt so heavy, so burdened. And I left feeling like I was on a cloud. Like he Amazing. literally lifted it all and yeah. took it. And I was for, I was actually at the time I was 15. Wow. So that's amazing. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all really the Lord that I'm here today yeah. and I'm 25 now. So it's been 10 years and he's pursued me wow. every day since. I mean, he has my whole life. Mm-hmm. But um, I would say God gets all the glory for how I'm even here today. It's so cool. Yeah. Um, I loved when you were talking about just the girl at school. Yeah. You know, I think that's encouraging to students today mm-hmm. to know that like just even before she had said anything to you. Yeah. That the Holy Spirit inside of her drew your spirit. Oh, yeah. Isn't that crazy? So you wild. Know that, um, you know, because we, we always hear that, like, growing up, I always heard that, like, you know, you don't even have to say a word. Like, people can see something different about you. And I remember, like, I believe that. I believe mm-hmm. that. But I've just, like, what does that even look like? Because I've <laughs> always been a Christian, like, yeah. since I was a little girl. So it's, and, I, and I've, I've had moments, and I have moments of, um, you know, real, like, encounters with the Lord that were life-changing, um, that changed me. But, I mean, I've always known God. Yeah. You know, so I um I remember in high school like my friends <clears throat> I went to Woodenville High School, so public high school. Mm-hmm. And um I had a friend group and I was the only Christian in, in my friend group and um they like they all knew that I was a Christian. Mm-hmm. And um in fact, they used to tease me. So do you remember the movie Grease? See, I was I literally yeah. was never allowed to watch that movie growing up. <laughs> um because I don't know, I wasn't allowed to. Um, I do remember <laughs> when I was like <laughs> in middle school, uh, my neighbors, I snuck over to my, my neighbor's house and watched some of it. So I had, <clears throat> I had an idea of like who Sandra was. Um, but my friends would sing that song about 
you know, Sandra D or something. And, mm-hmm. and, um, yeah. So like they knew that I was different and then I went to church and stuff. Um, but we never really, they never really like asked me about God or like, mm-hmm. you know, youth group or anything. So I just think it's such a testament to what God was, is doing in your life and has been doing the way he's pursued you. Even when you just didn't know him yeah. at all, even yeah. when you were right across the street from that church. And it's also cool how you and CJ and Nicole are still connected. Like they're still a part of your story Yeah, I of growing so in your much. faith. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you obviously continued going to that youth group mm-hmm. after giving your life to Jesus. Yeah. And, um, and then how did like, cause you're still serving in ministry with them. Mm-hmm. So how did that journey look like? You just kind of followed them and along their, their journey of <clears throat> mm-hmm. when they left well, youth ministry. <clears throat> and- I actually, so before CJ and Nicole even started dating, Nicole was a leader and CJ was the pastor. Oh, okay. So they weren't married when you were in that youth group. Yeah. Gotcha. Not even dating. Okay. And so, but it was just so funny because I remember like at 15, when I found out that they weren't dating, I was so confused. I was like, what? Like, you know, like, and I just assumed that they were, but that's how you know. Like God yeah. was like, you two need to be yeah. together. <laughs> if you're watching this, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Um, but they discipled me from like day one. I mean, they just really took me in and like mm-hmm. loved me. They were so patient with me and they would speak life and truth mm-hmm. to me in like the darkest moments. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of times I have literally showed up to CJ and Nicole's house, like mm. in tears, out of the blue, mm-hmm. like needing just, <laughs> it always makes me emotional. Think yeah. About. But yeah, just needing like a safe mm-hmm. place and just needing um, someone to speak life and truth in the word. Like yeah. they know the word. And so yeah. they're like, they speak that over you. Wise and, counsel. Yeah. And they, they love when, you're like not easy to love. Mm. And they always have told me like, you're so easy to love. And I'm like, I don't know about that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I mean, it was hard. It was Mm. really hard being 15 and, and following Jesus. Mm -hmm. It was not easy. And because I came from um, a background of addiction and uh, like incarceration and just dysfunction, all of it, like, I mean, you name it, mm-hmm. like I, it was so hard to really pursue Jesus in the midst of all of that and let him break off like chains and generational curses and generational cycles that just keep cycling through family member to family member. For me, like that was, and still is mm-hmm. like really hard sometimes. Cause I'm like, yeah. it's, it's like in your, it's in your psychology, it's in your DNA, it's in your in your family. And so, um, to allow the Holy spirit to bring that transformation and actually make you a new creation, like second Corinthians, uh, 14 or 15 says, like it is painful Mm. and it's, it's not easy. And so there would be, I mean, I gave my life to Jesus at 15, but I didn't stop like drinking until I was 21. Wow. So for years it was like, I still struggled with that. Interesting that you waited until you were 21. Literally. Legally. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> this is part of my story. And it's just like, there were a uh, lot of things that I didn't stop right away yeah. because I was like, I, this is what I've always known. And like, this is what my family has done. This is what I've watched. This is yeah. um, a part of me. And so to then when I like learn grace, when I learn the truth, when mm-hmm. I learn the word of God and really like, like let it just sink in and have that relationship with Jesus continue to grow. Um, I learned like the blood of Jesus is the DNA that runs through my veins. And so it's no longer um, all these things that are my identity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Mm -hmm. literally like I am God's daughter. I'm his child. And and so what he says is like who he says I am. And so, Um, yeah, I would say that because of CJ Nicole discipling me all these years and loving me and like me continuing to pursue Jesus, Mm -hmm. no matter how hard it was, Mm -hmm. that is the only reason 
that. And of course, like the Father's love, the Holy Spirit, like all of those working together is, is how I'm here. But it was very, very hard for many years because I was like, <laughs> I have no examples but people in the church. And so it was really like the church, the body of Christ that were, that took me in and like helped raise me yeah. to show me like, hey, you can have a different life. But they didn't verbally say that. Mm-hmm. It's just like, I'm watching them. Right. And I'm seeing the fruit of their life. Yeah. And I'm like, I want that. And I remember when I went to CJ Nicole's wedding, I just bald mm. because this is the first time I'd ever seen a godly Christian wedding wow. and the presence of God like filled the room at a, at a wedding. You know what I mean? And so That's from cool. there, I was like, I need to be with like a godly man. You That's know what cool. I mean? But I didn't have that example yeah. growing up. And so just a lot of things like, <laughs> Oh, it just makes my heart like <laughs> explode with joy because it's just, it's such a, a perfect illustration of just who Jesus is yeah, and who God is and that he doesn't like he, he chose you and called you even in the middle of your sin yeah. and mess yeah, and loved you through all the seasons and all the processes and all the stages of growing and maturing. And, and what it, the thing about Christians is like the longer, you know, the Lord, you know, hopefully the holier you become and the Mm -hmm. more righteous you become, but it's not about rules. It becomes more about just like that desire Mm -hmm. to please him Yeah, because he's done so much for us, Yeah, you know, that he's loved us through it all. And that's, that's the part that I hope people who are listening here Mm -hmm. is that God isn't waiting for you to fix your life before he will accept you. He wants to take you right where you are and love you and you just have to let him and then he through his you know as you pursue him as you spend time in his word as you go to christian community Mm -hmm. you know and do those things like you have to do those things yeah you have a responsibility in your growth like the salvation part like you just accept christ in your life you're like wow god i feel so free i feel so light and and that is true but then there's you know there's work to do (laughs) Yeah, and it's hard. Yeah. Because I remember, like, there were times where I wanted to, I didn't want to give up on Jesus because I was like, I loved him too much. Yeah. But at, like, age, like, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, like, all those years, every year was, like, those are hard a years. struggle because I didn't feel free mm-hmm. still. I was like, why am I still struggling with all of these different sins, mm-hmm. like, it's not even, it's just like, God, I've cried out to you. And like, why is this still yeah. such a struggle for me? And really it was because I was like, also not telling anybody that mm. I'm like struggling with all these things. Mm. I was trying to like fix it and figure it out on my own and yeah. like just me and God. And then when 2020 happened, oh man, mm. I fell in love with Jesus wow. and it was like, I had nothing else distracting me and all I could, I just wanted to be with him all the time. And so I was like in his word and I just felt like this stirring of Mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit saying, I want to heal those parts of your heart that you have been holding back from me. And so like 2020 was really a catalyst for Mm -hmm. like a huge part of breakthrough and healing for me. But even though, like before 2020, even though I was still struggling with all those things, I will say I never stopped pursuing God. Like mm. I still, in the middle of my sin, yeah. in the middle of my mess, like I would run back to him mm-hmm. and he would just shower me in grace mm-hmm. and love. And I think a lot of people give up because yeah. they're like, it's too hard. It's discouraging. Yeah. And they're like, why am I not free yet? Right. Like I'm ready to give up. And, yeah. and I get that. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I just, I remember like I would lock myself Mm -hmm. in a closet and just like pray and read his word and put like scripture all in it and, and just cry in his presence. Like that was me pursuing him Mm -hmm. in the middle of my sin, just because I knew like, I still need you. I still want you. Yeah. And 
this hurts. I'm like, I have so many questions. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and then after that is when I really like started opening up to people. Like this, these are all my struggles. Like I'm a mess. You probably thought I was perfect, but really. (laughs) And they're like, oh, we knew. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sure they could tell. And they just didn't say anything because it was obvious. They were probably just praying for you. They were. They totally, I know Sajay and Nicole were praying because they probably saw the mess I was and were like, like, they were trying to like disciple me and love me. But but they trust, they trust that the Holy Spirit is the one that brings conviction, (laughs) you know? Yeah. But eventually, like, I would just be honest and it's okay, this is what's going on. Yeah. And um, from there is really where a lot of freedom came. Because the Bible says to confess to yeah. a brother mm-hmm. and to each other. Yeah. And, like, yeah. you'll receive freedom. I'm paraphrasing that. but yeah, yeah, and I think because, you know, because we don't have to, you know, you talked about, like, locking yourself in a closet and praying. And I think, like... That represents you pursuing Jesus. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's not about us working, working to get to God. Like we For don't sure. have to do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have to like, well, I have to read the Bible this many hours. I have to spend this much time in church. You know, it's and then God will listen to me. Yeah. Um, I think like the Bible talks about how if we just take one step towards God, yeah. Like he takes all the rest. You know yeah. what I mean? Like we just he just wants to see one step towards him. And I think if there's, um, you know, if people are listening and they're like, Oh man, I totally relate to that. I'm just like, I keep going back to that same sin or like Mm -hmm. I keep falling back into the old temptations of, um, I think something that has really helped in my life. Um, and I'm sure you've experienced the same thing is, is asking God, where's the root to that sin in my life? Yeah. And, And just ask God to show you, um, like, where does that, like, what is that? Because I, I've confessed it to the Lord. Um, I don't want to do it anymore, but mm-hmm. I keep finding myself in the same place that there's a stronghold mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really um, good for people to ask God, can you just reveal to me where this started so that we can yeah. deal with that? Like if it's some insecurity, what, what is it that is pulling my heart back into this sin? Because we can... And God wants greater freedom for all of us. And we're all on that journey mm-hmm. of continuing in freedom as the Holy Spirit illuminates areas of our life that, you know, are broken and, and lost. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you about your family. And so, because, yeah. you know, you accepted Christ and they're probably seeing something different in your life. Mm-hmm. Like what were conversations that your family had about faith and like, how has that played out to this day? Like are other members of, of your family saved or like, you know, you can share as Such much or as little question. as you want. <laughs> Such a good question. Cause I know we're all on a journey and yeah. your family's on a journey and you know, God's doing a work in their life too. Yeah. Which is awesome. But like, yeah, I would say, so I don't feel like we really talked about it. Like when I became mm. a Christian as a teenager, um, I would try to talk to my sister about Jesus and because she was also a teenager, she would just like, she's older yeah, or right. young, younger she's than younger. you? She's younger. Yeah. So she was, she would just kind of be mean, you know, mm-hmm. she was just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like, I can't believe you believe that there's a God out there, you mm-hmm. know? And so I would just pray for her, you know, as a new believer, a baby mm-hmm. in the faith. Yeah. And then she came to Christ, like, I think a year later, she came wow. to church, raised her hand, gave her life to Jesus. But then um, we were both babies in the faith. Mm-hmm. So I continued to go to church and uh, she didn't. <laughs> she mm-hmm. went like right back. And so for years, I just prayed for her. Mm-hmm. I prayed for the rest of my family too, yeah. like my sister, my brother and everything. Um, my brother, he he believes in Jesus. He, you know, loves God. He doesn't, he's also a teenager right now, so... I think he's just trying to figure mm-hmm. things out. But um, for a long time, it felt like it was just me. Mm-hmm. So I felt very lonely. And mm-hmm. to be honest, um, a lot of the times I still do. Mm-hmm. Because even in my own family, whether they believe Jesus is real or not, and whether they you know, read the Bible or not, like we're all on very different pages. Um, and so... I would say like my family is still a work in progress. We've yeah. come a long way, 
I think like our relationships with one another have gotten a lot better, Mm -hmm. but we're not um, one big happy Christian family as, as I dream of, you know, where we're able to have these talks about the Lord and where we're able to like pray for each other, read the Bible together, go to church together. Like none of that, Mm -hmm. you know, has happened in my 10 years. And so sometimes I get really discouraged and I get like, is it me? Like, mm-hmm. am I the problem? Because mm-hmm. I did not represent Christ oh, good enough no. in moments that I should have, you know, and I'll just like go down this rabbit hole. But, um, mm. really it is the work of the Holy spirit yeah, and like, for sure you praying for them, being an example, still loving them when they are unlovable, yeah. speaking truth, you know, and giving grace yeah. when it's totally undeserved because mm-hmm. we all don't deserve it. And yeah. so there, there's been a lot of, a lot of things that God has done. And um, and with my sister, you know, she eventually did come back to the Lord (laughs) again. And that was really cool. Like we were doing Bible studies and we were going to church. (laughs) And like, I remember just telling everyone, like, thank you for praying for her. Like she came back. But I think it's just, it's, it's a wrestle, Yeah, you know? And so uh, recently with my, with my dad. So I'll just share that he, um, overdosed on February 1st of this year. Mm -hmm. And it's a miracle that he's alive. And so from there, um, his wife, uh, she gave her life to Jesus on the second day of him being in the hospital, which was just so miraculous. Like we're in the hospital February 1st and it's like crazy. You know, we don't know if my dad's going to make it overnight the next day. Um, CJ, a guy from my church and, um, one of my other friends from church, they come to the hospital. And so we're all four with my dad's wife, like standing in a circle and there's tears and there's like, can we pray for you? You know? Mm -hmm. And, um, as we're like about to pray for her, one of the guys from my church asks her, do you want to recommit your life to Christ? And she was just ready, you know, like, I don't think she she tells me now, like she didn't know that she could like, she had permission to like (laughs) ask Jesus for somebody to ask her. Yeah. Like she didn't know she had permission, like she could just do that. And so, cause she, she has a little bit of a background with the Lord, but like, you know, after years and years with everything that went down, I, I think, um, it, You know, she just kind of went astray. But so anyway, she gives her life to Jesus in that moment in the hospital because of my dad being in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And from and it was so cool, actually, in that moment, I just want to say it was literally like um, I think it's Hebrews. Four or maybe not about like in with unveiled mm-hmm. faces like we'll see him well yeah we'll behold him or whatever mm-hmm. um like the the veil was literally like removed from from her and wow. so i remember like as we're praying for her after she like gives her life to him i she was glowing <laughs> like and and when you look at her physically with your physical eyes you're like she looks a mess because she's just <laughs> bawling her eyes out her hair is crazy yeah, messy in the middle of trauma in the middle of trauma mm-hmm. of a chaotic event like mm-hmm. and her her eyes were like super puffy from crying so much but she looked like just glowing just and i was like the presence of wow. god is literally on your like all over you right now that's cool so we're all crying and um so she's been such a, just such a good mm. friend for me. We've been able to really lean on each other with Christ in the middle during the last five months of my yeah. dad being yeah. in recovery from all of that. And we're able to have talks about Jesus yeah. and faith and the Bible and prayer and miracles and just everything. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like... I wish I could talk with my whole family about this yeah. and me and her are not even blood related, but, um, wow. it is just so cool. All that God has done in the last five months and, and, 
in my life and yeah. in her life. And there's been people in the hospital that gave their lives to Jesus that I got to like share the gospel with wow. from, and my dad thought his life was worth nothing. Mm. He's like, I have no purpose. Like everyone hates me. I should just wow. die because of his addiction. Right. Like he had all of yeah. those I'm demons sure like lying to him, you know, just take your regrets. life. You're not worth anything. Yeah. yeah. And so it's really cool to see God literally take what the enemy meant for totally. evil and use it for good. Yeah. I mean, in the way that you um, are serving your dad, you know, when he can't mm -hmm. help himself, I think, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about how we, we want to protect life in the womb, mm -hmm. you know, when it's at that vul vulnerable stage and, yeah. Um, and even like newborns and children, like they're all precious. And then I think there's also that, like um, when people are handicapped or have mm -hmm. some type of, you know, handicap where they can't take care of themselves yeah. um, or in, you know, the situation where your dad's at just, Mm -hmm. you know, you caring for his life, that it's not about what he can do, but it's about who he is, yeah. you know, that he is just like you're a daughter of God and I'm a daughter of God. He's a son of God and, mm -hmm. you know, and loved by God and precious. And, you know, our world uh, too quickly wants to just write people off like, oh, yeah. you know, they're, they're broken a little bit or they're, we don't need them. They're going to be in the way they're inconvenient. Um, you know, and so, they make terrible decisions, yeah. Um, but every life is precious. And I remember um, one of the stories you shared with me. Well, a couple stories come to mind. I remember when you were doing my hair last time, you were telling me about how God had just really put on your heart to spend time with your dad. And mm. and you had just, or I think it was like a year amount of time that you, you just were like, I'm going to forgive him, even though you had, but you were like, I'm going to pursue a relationship with him. Yeah. And yeah. that you were able to really develop this relationship with him so that when this accident or when this overdose happened, like. Yeah, that was really special. I was just telling someone yesterday about this because she asked me, like, do you have a close relationship with your dad before mm -hmm. this? So I had to explain the history of just like. It's been years of me forgiving yeah. and healing and and giving grace. And yeah. when I went to Brazil last summer, um, yeah, that's right. That's what it was. That's when the Holy spirit, like just completely got a hold of my heart mm -hmm. and softened it like so much that I, and he told me clear as day, when you go back home from Brazil, you know, when you go back home, I want you to love your family. And I, was like, what does that look like? Yeah. You know, like, what do I you mean? Them. <laughs> From a distance. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. And um, specifically, it was like, I want you to go home and love your family. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this, my mom and my dad, mm -hmm. like, how can I serve them? How can I love them? Um, and so it was really soon after that, my dad had reached out to me and wanted to grab dinner, you know, and hang out. And for me, like if I hadn't had that encounter with God, I would have been like very, very mm, hesitant yeah. and like, no, I don't think so. And rightfully so. Yeah, rightfully so. But I had just such a soft heart and mm. I was nervous. You know, I, I can't say that I wasn't. I was nervous because I was like, oh, man, like I haven't seen him in so long. Yeah, and you're what, putting your heart out like? there again. Again. Yeah. And so um, I decided, yes, like let's let's meet up. And so we had hung out that day and we just had such a fun day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get so emotional it's amazing. <laughs> talking yeah. about it, but it was like, um, like a daughter just with her dad and I just loved him. I was like, wow. Like I just love my dad. I'm just such a, such a daddy's girl. And I didn't even know it. Like, I think I always knew it, but, um, being there with him, it felt like no time had passed, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just was like, I just want to be with him. Yeah. I felt, oddly enough, I felt like protected by him too. It was like, like I felt like there's no one that could hurt me because I'm with my dad. And yeah. I never like felt that before. Um, and so it was just really cool as an adult to feel that. And Amazing. have fun with him, hang out. And by the time um, we were done hanging out, I just like, I missed him. So we would text and just be like, I miss you. I love you. We would FaceTime. And that was very like new for us too. Wow. Because like we went from not speaking yeah. 
to we're FaceTiming, we're texting, we're calling. And I'm constantly like, you know, worried about him. Like, I just miss you. I love you. Like, you yeah. know, I want to share you. Sharing your life. With yeah. Him. And <laughs> um, so that was like um, October, November, or December. It was around Chris. That's it was cool. a little bit before Christmas. So I think okay. it was like November that this happened. And then by February 1st wow. um, is when, you know, he had had his overdose. Mm-hmm. That is also a miracle because usually when you like, <clears throat> when there's drugs involved, you know, you can pass away right away. And for him, he was left barely breathing for hours. And so God kept him alive. Wow. And I always tell people that is an answered prayer yeah. because I would pray all the time, like, God, I do not want to get a phone call that, you know, he's passed from overdose. Like, that was one of my fears for, like, many years. And I was like, I don't know what I would do, you know. Yeah. If I got a phone call like that and we didn't have a restored relationship. Yeah. yeah. Like some people get. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... Yeah, it's just an answer to prayer. It's a miracle that he's alive. And um, and it was just immediately, like, when I got to the hospital, I was like, I just, I know that God wants me to pray healing over him. Not mm-hmm. because I am a faith girl, which I am. <laughs> but, like, it was like, this is an assignment, you okay. know, because the enemy tried to take him out. God kept him alive. Yeah. And so this is, like, this is much bigger mm-hmm. than me. This is much bigger than him. This is not yeah. like, just let's pray for a miracle. <clears throat> um, and I remember on the third day, the doctor pulled me aside and he just was immediately presenting to put him to sleep. After three days was like, we can either, you know, take it day by day and see like how he'll do, or we can, you know, Hold put him one. to sleep. Um, and he would, Unfortunately, the doctors were very manipulative about it Mm. because I remember him using like language like, um, you know, would your dad want to live like this? If he does come out of this, he'll be a vegetable. Basically, he'll be in a vegetative state is what Mm -hmm. they say. He's not going to be able to walk or talk. And so like, really, you know him best. You know if he would want to live like this. And I... Couldn't say a word because I was like, if I say anything, like I'm going to blow up on them. <laughs> so <laughs> I just was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then when he got done explaining everything, I was like, okay, thank you. And uh, I like went to Asta a little bit later, my dad's wife. And I just was like, yeah, no, like we're not going to put him to sleep. Like, can you believe that they're trying to present that option, you know? Yeah. And she's like, it's crazy because it takes two weeks to recover from the flu, let alone like a big injury. It takes a lot of time, like three days. And I think they, they kind of wrote him off as, you know, an addict. And so let's just like, yeah. And it, again, it just reminded me how aggressive like the culture this culture death. is mm-hmm. a, with death like they do not value life right now and so crazy like that's their job yeah that's their job if there's any inconvenience kill it which is so sad to me it's it angers me and it really it's like this this righteous anger of like how dare you say that my dad's life is not worth living after and 3 days after three days, like as if he's not a whole person, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, um, he started to recover every day. He would actually start to get better and better. And we had people coming into the hospital every day, praying for him. Yeah. I was there every day, reading the word, worshiping, singing over him, declaring. And, um, so many people from my church, like, mm-hmm. I mean, I can't even name them all because there's so many and so many friends outside of my church, like they showed up and they prayed and they believed with me and they cried mm-hmm. with me. And, and, um, mm-hmm. my dad now it's been five and a half months and he is like, he's doing so much better. Like he, from where he was till now, like he's totally 
going to recover from this. It's just taking time. Yeah. But the doctor said that he wouldn't make it past, um, I think, like three months. Like some mm. doctors were like, oh, he's going to die after three months. And then other doctors were like, oh, after six months. Like I gave him six months. But all of wow. his organs are fine on their own. Wow. Like he doesn't need any assistance. It's Good. just waiting for that <clears throat> full healing, you know, yeah. where he'll be able to walk and talk. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he's there. Does he have there. any mobility on his own right now? Not on his own. He needs assistance with everything. Okay. Um, and so that has been definitely a journey yeah. for me to sure. like, as I'm taking care of him, actually, mm -hmm. the past few months, there's there in the beginning, there was moments where I was remembering trauma that I've been through mm -hmm. or like even hurts that I've been through with my dad. Mm -hmm. And I actually think like the enemy was trying to like cause this tension mm -hmm. and God was allowing it to like show me what's there still. Yeah. Yeah. And in the middle of like taking care of him and, and being there with him, I decided like, this is the gospel of grace. Like my dad doesn't deserve for me to take care of him when he's at his most vulnerable, but I'm going to anyways, because I love him. This is God's son and I'm not holding anything against him. And I've already been healed from that. Like that doesn't need to be brought up again, you know, as a yeah. kid. And so it, it's been, um, just this really, cool redemption story of just like, you know, being a kid and, and not feeling loved or like nurtured or safe, mm -hmm. um, around my dad because of his addiction to now, like, as I'm taking care of him and loving him and praying with him, I have like the father's heart for him. Yeah. Like the father, you know, God has literally given me heart for my dad in a way that I could not have, like, I would not have without him. Oh, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and I don't know how it's all going to, I don't know what else God has next. Yeah. You know, I know me that, too. It's just like, you know, in this short season of your life, how God has done so much, you know, even in the decade that you've known him and walked with him. Yeah. It's amazing. And I even think back to, you know, when you were in your mother's womb and even there, the enemy tried to take you out. Mm -hmm. You know, try to encourage your mom to like, don't, maybe, maybe you don't need to. Yeah. So with that, my, because I talked to my mom about it and she totally had the right and the option, not the right, sorry, not yeah. the right. She had the option, like if she wanted to, because she was young and not married to my dad and like my dad was super unstable at the time. Um, she could have aborted yeah. me, especially because my aunt was very much, and I, and I love my aunt. She's one of my favorite aunts to this day, but she didn't think that my mom should have me. Mm -hmm. Um, even though my mom had a job and she was going to college, mm -hmm. it was because she knew that I was going to have a hard life. Yeah. That she and wanted then your mom to, would too, you know, having to raise yeah. kids on her own and exactly, yeah. So for when I asked my mom, she said like I never wanted to abort you. People in the family yeah. thought that it would have been best because they wanted me to finish college and yeah. you know it's have just a home. Crazy to me that like like when did we get to a place where we we decided as a culture that that if there's a life in the womb that we get to decide. Yeah. yeah. Like, why wouldn't we just be like, Oh my goodness, there's a life. Like we need to rally. Yeah. We need to rally around that person. For Cause sure. that's such a time of like vulnerability. I mean, yeah. you don't feel great. Like you're producing a baby. It takes a village. <laughs> and then when the baby comes out, like you yeah. need continued support of yeah. like care, helping you care for that child and providing for needs and yeah. all the things like that's how our civil, that's how, that's how we're meant to continue as a civilization is mm -hmm. through procreation. Like that's, that's literally the design of humanity. Yeah. And, um, 
And I just, I mean, you're one, you're just one instance, so valuable and so precious, but just one example of how, like, if you weren't here today, mm-hmm. who would be, who would have advocated for your dad? Yeah. Cause I know you've continued to advocate for him. Like, no, he's going to live. Mm-hmm. Like get your hands off. He will yeah. live, you yeah. know? I mean, I just like, it's just, it's crazy to me. Um, just how precious each person's life is and yeah. you know and god is the one who decides when our last breath is yeah. god's the one who's going to decide you know when your dad's last breath is when your last breath when mine like yeah he alone man doesn't get to decide that mm-hmm. you know and i know it gets tricky you know in situations and we just we trust in the lord and we lean on his grace day by day for every decision that may come <laughs> across our laps you know we just we don't know yeah it's pretty but amazing to see how like my dad can't do anything for me, you know, right now. Mm-hmm. Like, but I love him so much. And I'm like, I just know, like, how much more does the father? Yeah. Like, when yeah. you're so a baby good. in the womb. So good. Yep. Like, can't you do can't anything. do anything for you're anyone. Sucking the life out of your mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, you're, you need to be, like, you just are so needy. Yeah. And and so it's like, but God loves you so yeah. much. Like Psalm 139. Yes. Like, you formed me yeah. in my mother's womb. Let me together. And, and so with my dad, I'm just like, I look at him and I just, I have so much love. And yeah. I'm like, you are you and I just love you for you. Yeah. Not. So good. Not anything that you have done, you know, mm-hmm. or haven't done. Yeah. It's like, just because you're yeah. you and. Yeah, with with babies, I'm very, I'm very passionate um, about moms mm-hmm. and babies, like knowing how loved they are, mm-hmm. and um, I want to, I want to even like, I want to be that mom that ends up adopting a baby that mm-hmm. almost was aborted. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, I will take your baby. Yeah, like that's who I want to be. I always tell people like, I want to, I want to adopt. And, um, it's actually really cool because I was fostered for Mm -hmm. a little bit. The family that fostered me was Christian really, and they would take us to church with them. Wow. And I didn't get to see her again until Mm -hmm. the other day after 20 years. Really? And we were both a puddle of tears because I was like, the impact that you made on me, Yeah, like I felt safe and loved. That's a big deal. In the presence of God at five That's years old. a huge deal. Yeah. It's precious. So um, I think the church needs to like also step into Amen. we're advocating for life mm-hmm. and we're taking care of life, you know, at the same time. Like, yeah. cause my dad, I'm advocating for him, mm-hmm. but imagine if I wasn't there to take care of him, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. as well, or no one was there to take care of him and, and continue to advocate yeah. for him. Yeah. Like, there's children that also need that. So good. the church can step That's into good. fostering children mm-hmm. that need to be loved and cared for yep. and adopting babies yeah. that were almost aborted. Yes. You know? Yes. And w- and another thing that Christians can do is vote. Yes. <laughs> in a way that s- supports life. Yeah. You know, if there are candidates who don't stand for life, mm-hmm. don't vote for them. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I agree. You know, and there's no perfect candidate. Mm -hmm. So you have to seek the Lord on it. But, you know, we have to advocate for life on every level, whether they're old or young, you know, whether they're on life support, whatever it might be, we have to advocate for life because that's what Jesus did for us. Yeah. And um, I know that God is super proud of you. And also I wanted to say that keep going on your podcast. I know (laughs) Adriana has a dream to podcast and... So if you're listening and you're like, I love to edit or produce, blah, 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 reach you out. Need to help me out. Reach out. Reach if you out. need your hair colored, reach out. Yeah. We'll trade we'll cut. services. Or I color and cut your hair. You edit. <laughs> She's already offered this to Ivan, by the way. <laughs> so we'll see if he takes up. If on. Ivan doesn't, you can. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, it's been so fun. I feel like we could probably talk for another hour. I know. But we won't. We'll save it for maybe we'll do a take two. Yeah. Just have me back. 
Totally. I would love to come back. Well, I'll come on your podcast sometime. <gasps> that would be so amazing. Be so great. Let's do it. Oh my God. I can't wait. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> so are you going to drive all the way to Black Diamond? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can yes. have it here at the church. It's not <laughs> actually that far. You how far? How long did it take you to get here? Over Today. an hour. Oh my goodness! It was like an Thank hour, you. like fifteen. Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. I traffic. It. Ugh. Traffic. Even without well, maybe traffic, you should it's stay like on this side until after traffic ends. Yeah. Well, I won't yeah, tell I'm you down. what to do with your day. <laughs> Well, let's close up with a word of prayer okay. and just we'll say goodbye to all of our listeners. Lord, we just thank you so much for this time we have to sit down. And I thank you for Adriana. God, I see your goodness in her life on display. We pray continued healing over her dad's body. Lord, that you would strengthen him day by day. We thank you for the salvation of his wife. Lord, we pray that you continue to work in her life and in all of Adriana's family. Lord, and I pray that you would just bless her in her graduation this next week. And we just thank you for that accomplishment in her life, God, as she's continuing to seek you in your kingdom and to work for you, Lord, in your kingdom. I pray your blessing upon her, upon her business, upon her podcast, God, and all the ways that you want to use her. I just pray favor and blessing upon her. And I just thank you for all of our listeners today, God, that they would um, learn something from you today about your character about who you are and about who they are, God, their identity in you. God, we commit all of this to you for your purposes and your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I want to say thank you to all of our viewers who have stayed with us for this entire episode. Um, I know there's just been so much to take in and so much good stuff, but I pray that you would would maybe share this podcast with somebody who you think could really benefit from hearing it. And we look forward to seeing you next time. God bless. <laughs>